on either side of you. To the west, Nevada. And to the east, Arizona. In Arizona, the Black Mountain Range. And in Nevada is the Newberry Mountain Range. The elevation here is about 530 feet above sea level. And you have to climb a little over 3,000 feet to travel above and out of this valley in either direction. The average amount of rainfall is about 5 inches per taken inch. In some years, we have been well above the average, and the desert shows its wonderful colors. In some years, we have a little to know. It just shows you this desert. FAA spent $23 million to facilitate our airport and terminal, including the new 7,500-foot runway, now see on the large embankment, accommodating the new larger passenger aircraft up to a 737 Boeing jet. The modern terminal is located just up the hill to the left of the tower. Bullhead City International Airport supports about 400 flights per week, counting both terminals and excluding our busy season. It is a history of the Colorado River, the five major dams now making up the reclamation system. The Colorado River begins at an elevation of 14,000 feet up north at a place called Grand Lumber, from Denver, Colorado. From there, it has a 1,470-mile journey to the Sea of Cortez. Before the dam was built, the Colorado River had a reddish color with all the sediment washing away the rock and sandstone of the upper Colorado Plateau. meaning River of Red. At one point, Father Garces found himself alone, separated from the county. And he was blessed to die in the desert. He was discovered and rescued by the Mojave Indians occupying this area. They nursed him back to hell. And he passed the name of this river along to the Mojave Indian tribe. And to this day, it is still known as the Colorado River. This river moved more sand and rock material than even the mighty Mississippi River. In fact, the Colorado River had moved four cubic miles of sand and sediment each 100 years. And over millions of years, is known for the building of Baja, California. Baja, as you know, is that long peninsula extending from Southern California southward, creating the Sea of Cortez between Baja and opportunity to visit the Canyonlands of the Grand Canyon and have stood there in amazement gazing at all the carved features created by this amazing river. Now you know where all the material ended up, washed down to Mexico to create another landmass. Early pioneers called this river too thick to drink and too thin to plow, and even said that no man would ever live in this God-forsaken place because it just too dry. They would be amazed if alive today to see what has become of this desert. Back in the fall and winter months, this river was nothing more than a trickle of water, not enough water for man or beast. Still, they came and tried their hand at living along its banks, farming and ranching. Sometimes they found themselves wiped out by the spring runoff from the mountain, a sudden flash flood. They might have felt lucky when the river dried up and changed its course, preparing the homes and fields. There is the story of a man who lived in Yuma, Arizona. One night while he was asleep, the river up and changed its course. The next day, he was high and dry, but discovered he was now living in California. Or he went to bed in California and woke up in Arizona. Either way, it shows you the power of this river and the need to control it to be of use to anyone.
far as we know, there has only been one man to travel the entire length of this river from Colorado to Mexico. His name was Jimmy O'Hai O'Hai. He managed this track in 1825 and 1826 while roaming this river traffic fever. He succeeded where others only tried to fail. It is not unusual to occasionally have someone who grew up in Davis Camp join us on one of our cruises telling us about their experiences growing up along this river and amazed at the changes in the childhood community. One such gentleman joined us not long ago and shared with us how they got rid of those wooden bridges, probably not the way they were doing today. They just set them on fire and burned them in place. One of them, after being set ablaze, just burned for hours, finally dropping down into the water and continued burning as it floated down the river. It floated under one of the bridges, not yet ready to burn, and caught it on fire. In 
casinos wanted a bridge to shorten the drive for their employees and patrons. But of course, the states were not interested in spending the money. So, Mr. Hoffman went to the bank and asked the builders to build the tunnel. So they did. But they didn't build it in a way that it could be expanded with more lanes in the future. First, the bridge just happened to be 20 feet right next to his casino. As I said, Mr. Hoffman was a savvy businessman. And you would think it would be easy to buy a bridge and give it away to each state as a gift. Well, no, it wasn't that easy. It took over $350,000 to get the necessary permits to build this bridge. One state jumped through all the hoops for both states, the federal government, and every environmental group you could think of. The permits were finally issued. And Mr. Hoffman wrote the check to his contractor for $2.5 million. Four months later, in July 1987, the bridge was open for traffic. One year later, it became quite clear that the bridge had become part of the highway system of Nevada and Arizona. So, naturally, Don Hoffman offered the bridge to each state as a gift. But it was not until Mr. Hoffman was willing to put up a $1 million maintenance fund that each state finally accepted the bridge. Despite our politicians, this bridge is an example of how one man's vision can be a winning bid for everyone. Which makes this trip to these states all the more exciting. Because the bridge was so desperately needed, and Mr. Hoffman got his bridge right where he wanted it. Well, we've tried to paint a mental picture of what this area was like before the dam was built and the park was destroyed. It was a river out of control. The land was of little use to anyone. Dry in the winter months, flooding in the spring and summer, it was too unpredictable to live near. In the early 1900s, those familiar with this river and its problems began to look at how to control the flow of the powerful Colorado. And to reclaim the water for vast reservoirs and irrigation and hydroelectric power. The side benefit was the recreational aspect, creating a playground for the boaters and a haven for the cowboys. So finally, the government undertook a trial associated with the trial courts. And finally, in 1935, it started the construction of the first major dam on the river, opened by Cowboys on December 30th, 1935, two years ahead of time. And it was the largest boater dam was dedicated. Our president, Franklin Roosevelt, dedicated this dam to the 31st president, Herbert Hoover. That is why it is called the Hoover Dam. The name was finally commissioned by Congress in 1947 as Hoover Dam. And it still named this today. Hoover Dam still stands as a monument to the human spirit and American engineering and tenacity. Remember, it was built in the 1930s. No computers, steam engines for power, men laboring 100 plus degree heat. Dangerous by today's work standards. The Hoover Dam is over 70 stories high, 726 feet in height, 640 feet at the base, and still 45 feet wide at the top. It contains three and a half million yards of concrete, all made on site and delivered with perfect timing and precision. Complete the job two years ahead of schedule and under budget. That does not happen today. In fact, a new bridge across Black Canyon ran four years long and over $700 million over budget. Concrete from the beginning to end was poured around the clock as one continuous pour without more lines to the cracks to this day. In fact, concrete is still curing and will yet for a few dozen more years. There are cooling pipes inside the dam to carry away the heat generated to this day by the cooling concrete. Hoover Dam backs up Lake Mead, a large lake with a shoreline of 1,822 miles. It is said that it holds up to two years the entire Colorado River's flow. Well, Hoover Dam was the first, but only the beginning of the dams to follow. It took the building of four more dams before the project was completed to control this river. The next two dams to be built were completed in 1938, just below and south of us. 
Parker Dam is near Parker, Arizona, and the Imperial Dam is near Yuma. Parker Dam backs up Lake Havasu. Lake Havasu is basically a reservoir in the city of Los Angeles. A billion gallons of water each day are pumped from near Lake Havasu to Los Angeles, across the mountain and the desert, to quench the thirst of an ever demanding population. This is an aqueduct capable of handling a billion gallons a minute. decided they wanted their own freshwater source, so they built a dam in Mexico. Because of the dam being built, not one drop of water now makes it to the Sea of Cortez. This entire body of water is used up along the way to be used and exploited for man to keep the West alive. Fishing is usually pretty good along the Colorado River. Since Lake Havasu runs only around 30 feet deep, Water temperatures in the summer months are around 80 degrees. Trout and night bass don't like those warmer temperatures, so they tend to migrate to this area, creating a fishing paradise. Remember what I told you earlier that they were just a cool, clear water when I wasn't kidding. The water we are on comes through Davis Dam. 